So, man, Dr. Lance, welcome to the Shaft Podcast, man. We appreciate you coming out. Thank you, brother Ali. Thanks for having me, my brother. Man, you've done so much in the city of Chicago as far as, uh, you know, working with uh, the inner city youth, this gun violence, trying to help curb the gun violence, and working with different organizations as well as the university. Um, and, and I know you to be a, a, a mentor to me and many others. My question is, uh, what's your background? Like, you, you wrote many books, but I think people don't understand your background and how you are connected to uh, what's going on today in Chicago or through Chicago's history. I think it's important for them to understand your background. Yeah, I, I, I do think it's important and I do have a unique background that gives me uh, a, a different perspective of the streets. And I think that perspective comes from the fact that I was raised by a father who was um, a, a street guy, but who had um, kind of matured out of gang life in his late teens, early 20s, uh, spent some time in St. Charles where him and some of his buddies uh, from 16th Street, 14th Street, that area, um, were the early uh, founders of the vice lords uh, before they came, became conservative vice lords. So um, as a street guy who my father ended up getting a job working as a youth outreach worker, kind of you know like the workers that we have that work for Chicago Cred and activists and um, Cure Violence and those kind of organizations. He was he was a um, he was a youth outreach worker, and in the summertime, I used to hang out with him when he was doing his work. So doing a lot of gang mediation, and so as a kid, I got a chance to be around guys who were those early founders of. Uh, the gangs that we know of today, so the Lower Stones and Disciples. So I got a chance to, you know, meet and interact with brothers like Jeff Ford, uh, you know, Bull, Eugene Harrison, you know, David Barksdale, those kind of brothers. I was around when I was a boy, a little boy. Uh, and so it gave me, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a different perspective of the streets, not just because I was around them as a kid, but because they were the leadership of these respective organizations. Um, my father was real close with brothers like Booney Black. Um, he was real tight with, with uh, I think, um, um, probably his, his, um, his, his closest buddy uh, was, was brothers like Cab and the brothers that, that work you know, in leadership with, with the Vice Lords. Uh, Bobby Gore and my father were real tight. So, you know, coming home or, you know, being out in the streets, I would be around brothers like that. And so it just gave me a unique background into these organizations. Um, uh, but I always say, you know, although I was raised by the streets, so those guys raised me, but I wasn't raised in the streets. You know, I didn't I wasn't a gang banger myself. I was just around them. And they always made clear to me as a shorty coming up that you know, my responsibility was to go to school. You know, they would always talk to me about school, how I was doing the school. So it kept me focused on school. So then that brings another perspective that I have. So although I understood the streets and spoke the language of the streets and rubbed shoulders with the brothers and sisters in the streets, I also was a schoolboy, right? And so I took that trajectory for myself personally. And then what happened was uh, when I finished undergrad, um, I got a job teaching in Chicago public schools. Uh, and because I had that background with street guys, this was around uh, the mid 80s, late 90s. By the time I get to you know, my work as a young brother in the community, it was a time where you saw a resurgence of Chicago gangs because probably the late 60s to the early, um, early to mid 80s, gang violence and gang activity had kind of gone on a decline. Right, so it started to resurge when the crack cocaine epidemic came back in, or what came into play. So as a young brother who was working in schools, I was the person that the schools would rely on to work with the little brothers and sisters that were gang banging. And because you know, I understood that culture, I understood that language, and because I understood that, uh, they felt comfortable dealing with me. So whenever, it was, whenever there was conflict in the school or in the community, I was one of the people that they would rely on to help, you know, get the little brothers back on track. And so ultimately what I did was I used that as a stepping stone professionally where I started my own nonprofit organization to work with schools, uh, get contracts with schools to work with 
the little brothers and sisters that were active in the streets. And so then that brought me in contact with a new generation of, of you know, young brothers and sisters that were gangbanging. I had that first generation from a boy. And then as a young brother and a professional, I get the new generation. And so I was always able to connect the dots because what happened was in the early, late 60s, a lot of those brothers got locked up. So the transfer of knowledge from one generation to the next got misplaced and there was like a gap. So I've always been the kind of guy who was able to connect the two dots because, because I didn't get locked up and I stayed on the streets. I was able to transfer the old school with the new school and it, you know, it, it, it resonated well and I'm still able to, to make that. So um, last but not least, the third thing that I did, I think, to make me was um, I ended up going back to graduate school and uh, ended up wanting to pursue a, a, a doctorate degree so I could teach. And so once I accomplished that goal, then that gave me the ability to teach at a university and that gave me the opportunity to do research. And, you know, I was trained in research uh, in a doctoral program, so I took that first-hand experience, the lived experience of growing up with guys who were leaders of, of our, our top street organizations, I had that information to go with being connected with the young brothers and sisters that were active at the time and combining that with my research skills and then I was able to bring those three things together. So that kind of, you know, mo you don't have a lot of people that have that kind of experience. If, if they have the lived experience in the streets, a lot of time they don't get an opportunity to go to school. If they went to school, a lot of times they weren't connected to the streets. If they're academics and professors, a lot of time they weren't connected to either one. So I'm the kind of individual that, you know, I got uh, all three going on at the same time to get yeah, a unique. Yeah, it's, it's unique. It's, it doesn't make me any better or smarter than anybody. It's just, a, you know, unique experiences and different experiences. You know, uh, often I hear brothers and sisters around the world when they're speaking about Chicago. They talk about where the OGs at and what happened with the OGs. So that was some clarity you just put right there. Just the fact that you know uh, some of these guys got locked up and the transferring of information didn't take place. Uh, that may have took place in other places. That's right. Okay, but moving forward, you you, you started out on your journey with writing books. What took you that? What made you want to say, look, I'm a I'm going to get into the, the book writing process. Yeah, I, I think because, you know, although I went to school and I didn't like school, you know, I went to school because my father made me go to school and my people and his people, you know, stayed on me about school and doing. So I wasn't really a person that really loved school. I didn't really like reading and that type of thing. But uh, I was interested in learning and I was really interested in I like history and that kind of stuff, but history was always boring to me. So in terms of writing a book, um, I got to the point when I got a little older, a little bit more mature, and I wanted to know things, and I couldn't get the information from people who, like my father and them, they didn't really like talking about the streets and history, right? Because the street dudes, number one, that kind of goes against the code of the streets to be talking about your business, right? All of this talking about the streets is relatively new when the rap music industry came into existence. But the, the original dudes, they didn't like talking about their experience, probably because they was traumatized by it, but it wasn't, it wasn't pretty, you know, and so they didn't like, so I couldn't get it from them. So to answer your question about writing the books, the reason that I started writing these books was because it was a book I wanted to read, but it hadn't been written. So I was like, hey, look, you know, I, somebody needs to write this story because we knew early, like when you, you know, the work that I was doing with Young Brothers back in the, you know, from the late 90s, I'm sorry, late 80s to today, nothing captures the attention of African-American youth, especially Young Brothers that's in the streets, than the history of the street organizations. If you want to capture their attention and hold their attention, you can tell them those stories and those narratives because it's a part of their legacy and they're interested in it. So when I saw the power of that, then I knew that I needed to write these books to preserve that history, to pass it on, because I knew it was, it was just in telling them the stories, it was powerful. So if I could write it and, 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 and codify it and preserve that history in a book, a text, I knew I had something special.
You are also uh, known as a gang expert, would you say that? I don't, I don't like to use that term, but some people would say that, and let me tell you the context in which they say it, or I'm given that title. So as you know, in the, um, in the so-called criminal justice system, especially as it relates to um, um, the world of, yeah, criminal justice, so, you know, brothers and sisters who catch cases, right? So in criminal defense and criminal prosecution, uh, there is a role for what is called an expert witness. You could either, either have an expert witness on the prosecution side, you have expert witness on the defense side. Um, and the expert witness as it relates to gangs and, and expert witnesses as it relates to gangs on the prosecution side are the police. So let's say a young brother catches a case um, uh, and when he goes to trial, prosecution, the state is going to bring an expert in to testify against him. Well, on the, on the defense side, they can uh, have uh, expert witnesses too. And basically those individuals that are experts are academic people, academics who study, you know, from an academic or scholarly perspective, gangs and violence. So because I had that background, um, at a certain point, defense teams would reach out to me and ask me what I'd be willing to work with them on cases. And so that's how I ended up getting a title expert witness because I work for the defense of uh, primarily young brothers who get, catch gang cases or you know, criminal, criminal uh, uh, violent you know, murders and that type of thing. Yeah. And, and when those cases come up, often what do you see that's, a, that's misunderstood you know, as far as the criminal justice system, something that they may make blanket or that's a major misunderstanding when it comes to that. Yeah, I, you know what, it's more, uh, you know, so there, I don't see a lot of misunderstanding. I see a lot of just blatant lies and mistruths coming from state and prosecution where they are prosecuting individuals for gang ties or gang related activities when they full well know that it's not gang related. Right, but they could get away with it because in most cases, the uh, defense don't have experts that can counter the state. So when, when you're talking about experts, the experts are different in terms of being witnesses because they can testify to hearsay. So in other words, if you're a regular witness, you can only testify to something that you've seen you were directly involved with. But expert witnesses can give you their opinion of something. And so what I've seen is, I've seen the state and the prosecution use police to fabricate evidence against them individuals and then prosecute them based on something that wasn't true. And if you don't have a defense expert on your side, then basically it's like a basketball game where the, your, the team that you're playing against gets to shoot and take shots, and you don't, right? So what's what's an example without saying names? Okay, I'll say. give I'll give you an example. I just I just testified for a young brother on behalf of a young brother uh, just this past week, right? And so there were this guy was was intentionally misidentified by the police for being. Um, a perpetrator in a murder based on now this this was this was a, a, a Latino gang they operate a little differently today than African-American gangs but as you know back in the day all gangs used to represent on folks and brothers of people alliances so you know back in the day for us as African-Americans if you were on their folks alliance you did everything your representation was on the right. You know, you might break your hat to the right or you might, you know, um, uh, you might roll up your pants leg on the right or something. And if you were people of brothers, you know, you would do it to the left. Well, in this particular case, there was a, a, a shorty that got killed. And on the scene were two 11 year old boy and a 17 year old boy that were actually on the scene as witnesses. They told the police that the shooter had a teardrop on his right eye and they gave you know uh you know a description 17 year old just told the police on the scene and then he left the 11 year old was convinced by the police uh, uh well his his mother was convinced to bring him to the station and go 
look at a lineup of individuals to see if he could see the, the shooter. And when he gets there, they have uh, about five guys with teardrops or band-aids on their left eye to cover teardrops on the left. Now the police did that on purpose because they wanted to set up a scenario of left against right. The kid that got shot and killed was folks. I'm sorry, the kid that got shot and killed was, um, uh, uh, yeah, he was folks. Right, he had he he was he was with the he was with the brothers on the on the right side, right, and so because in the neighborhood there was a um, a brothers faction, that was a perfect scenario for them, left against right, but in reality, it was another group in the area, who was folks too, and they were into it with another group of folks, right, in close proximity. So instead of identifying the, the group that was the likely shooter, teardrop on the right, hat broke off to the right, they went and turned the whole scenario on his head and said it was somebody to the left. So what I was able to do as an expert witness to come in and say, first of all, you got witnesses that said that the teardrop was on the right. And when I looked at the picture, his hat was broke to the right. I said, these folks, this guy that you accused is on the left. He a brother. This don't make sense. And he beat the case. Man, that's good. We happy to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Man, that's good. And, and we and we need more people like you being able to be expert witnesses. Not to not to uh, lead. You know, uh, we don't want to promote somebody uh, doing something wrong and 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 being uh, free for something that they did wrong. But definitely. If it's, if it's a situation where there's a, somebody who's being railroaded, mm -hmm. you know, we need more people to be able to stand up and say, look, no, nah, that's not, that's not right. Yeah, yeah. In, in this position, this is how this goes. Yeah. So, man, we appreciate you taking that, taking on, on that position. Mm -hmm. uh, but your, your first book that you co-wrote, uh, The Almighty P. Stone Nation. Yes, the, it's, it's the Almighty Black, Almighty Black Peace, Almighty, Almighty Black Peace Stone Nation. Okay. Rise, fall, and resurgence of an American gang. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how did you? So let's let's talk, tell us about that book. Okay, so that that book basically is uh, I co-wrote it with a sister, a young uh, journalist named Natalie Moore, um, uh, and it was it was a really a good fit you know, in terms of, of writing a book because she's a, a journalist. So we wanted to make sure that we had that uh, connection. But so that book basically attempted to um, tell the history of uh, the almighty Black Peace Stone Nation. Some, some brothers and sisters today call them, you know, Moles or, you know, they've had different names uh, during their uh, evolution, started off as Black Stone Rangers then became um, what we would call Black Peace Stones, and then became El Rukins, and then you know, reverted back to being Black Stones as what they refer to as today. Some, some brothers stayed, you know, brothers that were part of the El Rukin era still remain a part of that movement. It depends on the era, you know, some brothers say to this day, I'm a Black Stone Ranger. It just depends on the era that you were born or you were, you were the most active in the organization. But most of us today refer to them as the, you know, the um, Black Peace Stones. And um, uh, the book tells their history from their origins to today. Yeah. Okay. And, um, you know, being from, your origins come from the West Side, mm -hmm. you grew up on the West Side. Was the, what, what led to you writing about the Black Stones? Because it's a South Side organization. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Was there any connection with the West Side organizations and, and, and what you came from growing up, what you saw growing up? Yeah, that, that was that was that was that's a really good question. So I'm not, I didn't grow up on the West Side. My parents are from the West Side, but they move move south, right? So actually, I grew up uh, in Harvey, Illinois, right, and then move as I when I finished undergrad. So. I went to high school out there, but then I went away to college. And when I came back home from college, I lived in the city. Um, but the neighborhood that I grew up in in Harvey 
was uh, a, a, a Blackstone neighborhood, or during that time they were L. Rukins. So a lot of my friends growing up were, you know, were L. Rukins. Uh, and the reason that I started with the um, with the Stone story is because I had access and a, and a connection with Chief Malik, who was the leader of the Stone. So it was a good place for me to start because um, b before writing these stories, it's like super important to me to make sure that I reach out to the leadership of the organization to make sure that they're comfortable with me telling their story because it's their story, not mine, right? So the first thing I did was because I had, I grew up in a, in a stone neighborhood, because I grew up around Chief Malik, or as some people know, it's Jeff Fort, and he knew me as a kid growing up. Then I was able to reach out to him at the time he was uh, incarcerated at um, uh, uh, at the uh, ADX, the Max Prison in Florence, Colorado. So I just wrote him a letter, you know, um, refreshed his memory of you know who I who I am and who I was and who I was connected to, and told him I was interested in you know writing a history of the Stones. And so he wrote me back and told me who. Uh, he thought that I should get in contact with in terms of those who represent his interests on the streets today. And then they were able to help me facilitate talking to the people who could help me pull the story together. Yeah, I know these are, you know, people read about these stories in books yeah. and newspapers, but, you know, for a lot of people, these are real stories, right? This, yeah. this, this, these are like people's lives, yeah. you know, oftentimes. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, they can be misconstrued in a story that you hear on the news or in a tweet or yes. an Instagram post, but these are real people. Mm -hmm. And so you're dealing with, you know, touchy subjects. Do you ever, like with that book, right, with, your, with the book about the, the Black Peace Stone Nation, did you receive any pushback oh, yeah. about anything yeah. from, from anybody, but particularly from just like people that were members of that, that, that nation? Oh yeah, absolutely. You get pushed back. Um, uh, and the reason that you get pushed back is because all of these organizations have, um, have um, been infiltrated and um, targeted by law enforcement, federal law enforcement, and local law enforcement, that the infrastructure of a lot of them in terms of the incarceration of the leadership have um, uh, disrupted the continuity. So what happens now is you have these groups that exist in factions. So what happens is even though I may talk to the leadership, and may get the authorization from the leadership is still other factions within the group that don't know, they don't communicate with each other. So when the book comes out, then, then the different factions are gonna come holler at you like, hey, you know, who are you? Who authorized this? You know, what, what are your intentions, right? So yeah, you gotta deal with that. But, and that's the reason that when you write the story, like I write them from the position of not dehumanizing and criminalizing the groups to 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 write these stories as uh, these organizations being a part of the fabric of the black community. Right. So once they see that, oh, he ain't on trying to, you know, criminalize us or um, to uh, uh, desecrate our history, that what he's really doing is he's trying to um, show us in our true light, you know? So you do have to tell, there, there have been some, you know, there are some criminal sides of the story, but then they're also, you're looking at these organizations, they've been a part of every major movement that's existed in black Chicago. You know, they were there with Dr. King, you know, they supported Malcolm, you know, they supported, you know, education for you know youth in their communities they were a part of you know movements with the panthers and they organized so those are the stories that i'm trying to tell the stories that people don't really we may know about them in our community but no scholar has ever written about these organizations in that way generally they're writing about them only from a criminal perspective right so once all of the brothers and sisters see the direction that i'm going then it's well received, but initially you do you do get pushed back, and you do get um, yeah you get people coming like yo you know who are you and who gave you the authority to write this and you know you just got to be ready for that. Yeah, I mean if you, as long as you. 
cross your T's, dot your I's, yeah. you know, you feel confident about mm -hmm. what you put out there, you know what perspective that you're writing it from, you know, you, you just, you're just ready, you just have to be ready for it. That's right, that's right. Excellent, you know, and just, just kind of hovering on this topic just a little bit because all of your work is really, really informative, all of it is really important, and mm -hmm. it, it comes from this purview, again, where, again, you're not, this is not just a, uh, a, you know, uh, it's not a tweet, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just some dry, it's academic, mm -hmm. for sure, mm -hmm. scholarly, for sure, mm -hmm. but it's not some some dry piece of work that's just talking about people's lives, right? Yeah. So, you mentioned too, like, the, you know, you mentioned Jeff Ford, mm -hmm. you mentioned the leadership of the Blackstones. What is, um, what 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 was your, what was your relationship with Jeff Ford? You said you wrote him, you communicated with him. Mm -hmm. Though these were people and names that you that you as a little boy you mm -hmm. had relationships with. Mm -hmm. Can you just speak more about that? Yeah. So I, you know, I wouldn't say that, uh, and I don't want to misrepresent my relationship with with Chief Malik uh, as if we were best friends or we kicked it with each other. You know, he was um, close and tight with my father. Right. And so he knew me as the son of my father's name was Malik as well. That was that was his uh, 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 taken name when he converted to Islam. So they you know, they had that in common. My father was a little older than them. But, you know, so he knew me, you know, uh, as the son of my father, as a shorty growing up. And then he he our relationship was um, was kind of solidified in one of his his protégés, one of the young brothers that grew up under him as one of his generals, a brother named Ashamadeen, was the brother who was kind of the big homie in my neighborhood when I was growing up. And I grew up with Ashamadeen's, we, 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 you know, we call him J-Dub growing up, but J-Dub, his brothers, and I were like really good friends growing up. And so uh, once Chief Malik had all of that information and you know he oh yeah I remember you as a, you know he knew different things so I was able to um, forge the relationship and, and solidify that because of my background with people that he knew and that he trusted and um, uh, you know because of my relationship with people that he trusted and he trusted me to you know do the work that I was able to do on the history of the organization so yeah so many it's, it, it, you working across the spectrum of, yeah. of, of Chicago history, of Chicago black history, you know, yeah. not just the, the, the street organization mm -hmm. history, but just the history in general. Mm -hmm. So you're writing, you know, you, your, your background with your family and your father's affiliation mm -hmm. with the, the, the vice war movement. Mm -hmm. And then your first book is on the almighty Blackstone Nation. Mm -hmm. And then you pivot yeah. to your current book. Yeah. So. Um, you know, that, that pivot came and, it, and I don't, I really, I wouldn't call it a pivot. It's kind of a continuation of the first book. So what, when Natalie and I wrote, uh, the Almighty Black Peace Stone Nation, I think one of the things that I learned from that book and writing that book was that it's impossible to really do a good job on a story like that, taking a comprehensive perspective, you know, trying to do it from beginning to today because it's so much history. And what happened was with that book, I felt like we weren't able to really delve deeply. We could tell the surface story of it. And that's one of the critiques that we got from the first book uh, was that, you know, well, you didn't, you didn't tell this part, you didn't go deep enough. And of course you can't go broad and deep the book could probably be 5,000 pages, right? And so that's just really what's supposed to happen in, in our community if, if everything was, you know, our academic community was, was intact, then it would be multiple authors that would have written, just like you got thousands of books written on, you know, Al Capone. You know what I'm saying? This is the only book that's really been written in a comprehensive way. So basically that first book was kind of like a superficial. So the second book I said, I want to go deeper. And I realized in order to go deeper, I wouldn't be able to go broad. So what I did was I, I went from the beginning in terms of the context of the conditions that brought the black disciples into existence. And then I stopped with the death of David Barksdale. 
and didn't take it past that because that would have been trying to do too much. So I feel like the second book gives, gave me an opportunity to really tell a, a more quality story, to get down in, in, in kind of, you know, in depth kind of description of the black disciples and their evolution. Uh, <clears throat> this second book is phenomenal um, in such a way because you, you, you take two worlds and blend them together. You're talking about Balls Daily, mm -hmm. the first Richard Daly, <clears throat> that I don't think a lot of people know uh, today. Mm -hmm. the, the generation of today don't know the history and mm -hmm. the climax of the reason why Chicago is even uh, structured the way it is mm -hmm. today, with red line is still being uh, mm -hmm. live and prevalent with uh, racism throughout, uh, you know, from the police force to the Five fire departments, so, you know, mm -hmm. it's still prevalent. God willing, we kind of getting out of that, but mm -hmm. it's still there. But those seeds were planted um, largely during that daily era, um, or, or, or water during that era. Can you speak to that? How how did how did it happen, and 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 how was it allowed to kind of? Continue to manifest. Yeah, that's a really good question. So, um, and, and, and I think that's the reason that I wanted to uh, write this so-called braided narrative to show the interaction between uh, the black disciples and their interaction with the Richard J. Daley administration. So uh, I spent a lot of time on the front end of that book laying the context and the foundation for the um, the evolution of the black disciples who started off as the devil, devil's disciples, right? So all of these organizations didn't just pop out of thin air. They were they came out of conditions of segregation, right? And so Richard J. Daley, his his legacy was um, segregation. That's what he stood for. He wanted <clears throat> he wanted to keep Chicago a segregated city based on based on race. And so as an Irishman who had his origins in from Bridgeport, the neighborhood of Bridgeport, which was a stronghold for the Irish uh, community at the turn of the last century, um, he was a member of a, a street gang called the Hamburg Gang. And so what I wanted to show is how the Irish street gang under the leadership of Richard J. Daly was able to organize themselves as street gang members to get involved in politics, and then but hold on, man. yeah, because because they 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 cloak this as a club. Yes, they they it, an athletic they, club. They they cloaked it as an athletic club. Uh, so I want to read because people will look at oh, street gang. No, it was a street gang that was that was masquerading as an athletic club. Yes. Go ahead. Well, you know, and it's, it's interesting because while they call themselves the Hamburg Athletic Club, the police called them a gang. And just as the, the, the devil's disciples called themselves a club as well, the police called them a gang. So I wanted to show the similarities. Um, by far, the Hamburgs were a street gang. And they stood for, um, they were no different than any other street gang. They just used athletic club. But everybody used athletic club. The black gangs used, the vice lords were, at, you know, if you ask them, they told you that they, 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 they existed to be a softball team playing against other black clubs. You know, so a lot of street, so-called street gangs used the term club. But in society, if you went back to the early 1900s and you asked about the Hamburgs, they weren't gonna say no athletic club, they was gonna say a street gang, right? right? And so, and, and you know, they were very instrumental in the 1919 riots. They were the ones that led the 1919 riots against black people where, you know, almost 50 people got killed, right? So they were at the forefront of that. And at the time, Richard J. Daley was the president of the club or the Hamburgs. He was the leader. Of the he was the leader. He was the leader of the gang, right? And they ultimately got, uh, uh, they were taken under the wings of, of, of 11th Ward Democratic 
aldermen and committee men who use them to intimidate other ethnic groups to either vote for the Irish or to uh, not vote at all. So what they did was they used that experience of being kind of the muscle for, you know, uh, elected officials uh, in the 11th Ward Democratic machine. They learned how to organize themselves into a democratic machine and ended up putting some of their members in the office and then ultimately gaining control over City Hall. But their purpose mainly was they fought other white ethnic groups, but primarily their goal was to keep black people out of their neighborhoods, right? So that's what they stood for, to kind of be the, um, the vanguard for keeping Bridgeport Irish and black people out of Bridgeport. And uh, what do you think happened when the leader of the vanguard to keep black people out of Bridgeport becomes the mayor of the city of Chicago? What do you think his goal is going to be? black people out of, out, of, out of a white area. That's right, and that's what he stood for. His whole life was about keeping black people in their place and keeping them segregated. And then on top of that, who do you think was his biggest concern? If his, if his whole orientation as a gang chief or a gang leader was to keep black people segregated, who do you think he felt would be his biggest competition and his greatest rival? If he came from gangs, he, he thinking the gangs would be his best friend. And, and so his whole orientation was to make sure black street gangs never evolved into political power like he was able to and his organization was able to. And that's where you get the tension that I write about in the book, King David versus, or King David and Boss Daly because... So, so yeah. this is what I just heard him say. Mm-hmm. Once he recognized the ability for gangs to transition into something legal, legit, and still use their, the way they thought mm -hmm. in another realm. Yes. Just like, okay, if, I, if, I'm, Irish, if I'm Irish and I translate it and, and, and mature into politics. Yes. And, or the police department. Or yes. if I'm Italian, and I mature into construction. Yes. In real estate. Yes. Right? If you're black, uh uh. Now let, let's see how we can stop that from happening because they can mature and become something greater than what they are, and we have to put that to an end. Was it the same way for the for for the Latino organization? Well, you, you have to take into consideration the Latino organizations came much later. Mm -hmm in terms of the history of, of Chicago. So um, the black organization, street organizations began to evolve uh, in the late 50s, early 60s. The Latino organizations, uh, by the time they began to evolve, it's the 70s, late 60s, early 70s. So we kind of had a head start in terms of, of our formation. By the time they come, everything is pretty much sold up in terms of, 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 of street leadership and political leadership, right? And then it was a different culture too, where when Latinos came, they were not interested in, in getting involved in uh, local politics because their culture spoke to self-sufficiency where they created their own economy within their own neighborhoods that was self-sustaining and you know the politics wasn't something that they were particularly interested in. They were getting money and, and sending that money back to their native land and, and moving back and forth. We didn't have no place to go back to, so everything we did had to be about what's happening on, on, on the ground with us today, and that's what makes their experience different than ours. Wow. Yeah. Um, that's really interesting, because one thing that I'm hearing mm -hmm. is, is blowing my mind, because one thing that I'm hearing is the layout as we see Chicago right now, mm -hmm. the, the redlining, the segregation, how basically the Chicago that we live right now in this mm -hmm. year, 2023, is primarily the result of a gang war from the early 1900s. You hit it, you hit the nail on the head. That's exactly what it was. And um, unfortunately, we lost the war. We lost the war. Um, the war started 
in 1919. I mean, the gang war actually kicked off in 1919. Most of our ancestors got here in 1916. You, 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 you had to take into consideration this. So what happened in the early 1900s, there was a war, you know, uh, I, the Irish community were the lowest on the European ethnic totem pole. So the Irish were considered the lowest of the low in the white world. And they were basically uh, brought here to do the, uh, the jobs that nobody else wanted to do. So they, yeah, they working back at that time, they working in the, in, in the back of the yards, in the stockyards doing the dirtiest of dirt work, right? Um, and so what happens is, World War War World War One kicks off in the early 1900s, right? And they needed them to go fight in this war in World War One. So they took the poor Irish men and they sent them off to fight in World War One in Europe. But somebody had to do their jobs in the, the, the stockyards, which at the time Chicago was the the center for the beef industry, all of the beef came through Chicago. So you needed bodies to replace them. So who do you think those bodies were? They went and recruited our ancestors from the South. That's how we ended up coming up here. We didn't just come up here on our own. We were enticed to come up here in the name of getting you know, better jobs and a better you know, living, but it was really, a, it was a trick. We were enticed to come here to replace them while they went to war. So we come up here and they put us in the neighborhood right next to Bridgeport, which is Bronzeville. Only one street separated, you know, it wasn't the expressway back then, it was just the one street, right, Wentworth, that separated Bronzeville from Bridgeport. So when the war was over with, the Irish came home, who was in their jobs? Us. So how you think they feeling? They salty. This like 1915, 1916, black people coming in droves up here for these jobs. We take their jobs, they upset about it. Not only they upset about that, they upset because the mayor who worked with some black, our black leadership to get us up here was a Republican and the Irish were Democrats. So not only were we in their jobs, we were political oppositions to them. We were Republicans back then, black people were Republicans. And so they was like, man, this is, and a war ensued. They actually attacked us. And, you know, um, the leader of the group that attacked us was the Dailies, Richard J. Daly, and he ultimately became the mayor. So as you mentioned, that's just, it's just the way Chicago was organized was a continuation of that initial interaction in that war. And it hasn't ended yet. You know, uh, mm -hmm. Just just to share the power, I, I've heard this before and I've read it. They said that uh, JFK mm -hmm. uh, would would who, who's Irish? Yes, would have never became president if it wasn't for Richard uh, J. Daly. That's true. That's true. Because Richard J. Daly was able to use their political sophistication of basically securing votes through um, the uh, democratic machine and stealing electoral college votes that they were able to use to push J.F. Kennedy over to become the president of the United States of America through the electoral college. All of the votes that they were able to amass in Chicago gave Kennedy the necessary votes to become the president, right? There was a, there was a, um, and there's also a, a very strong connection between Richard J. Daly and the Irish Mafia, because the Irish Mafia, not the Irish Mafia, the Italian Mafia, off of 26th Street. So as you know, in, in Bridgeport, the back end of Bridgeport, the north end of Bridgeport, is a historic Mafia uh, uh, territory, 26th Street. And um, it was, uh, and, and I write about it in, in the book, um, uh, there was this a, a, a man by the name of Tom Munzio who was a friend of Richard J. Daly. He was the person who was the bag man for Sam Giancana and some of the top uh, Chicago outfit syndicate gangsters gave Daly the money to, to fund his political campaign to become the mayor. And 
what Daly was supposed to do in return. And if you read the newspapers back in the day, you heard them lamenting the danger of Daly becoming the mayor because they said if he becomes the mayor, the Italian mafia are going to be able to take over this city because they are the ones that gave him the money and he's beholden to them, which was true. And so when Daly became the mayor, what he did was he took away all of the, 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 the top. Uh, they had a special unit within the Chicago Police Department to investigate and prosecute the Italian mafia. And when Daly became the mayor, he disbanded that unit uh, and he allowed the Italian mafia to a, a point. They already had a lot of influence in the first ward and, you know, the aldermen and stuff. But he allowed them basically to continue to run their their prostitution rings, their gambling rings, all of their crime and vice. You know, uh, so he was a, he was a friend to them, you know, for a long period of time until they fell out with each other. That's that's another story. But yeah, that was a strong connection. So when you look at um, how did you connect Daily, Balls Daily and King David? How did you make that connection? Um, so, you know, as a researcher, one of the things that I um, that I do, and I, I, I try to be really intentional about it, is I try to use a process called triangulation. And instead of just getting information from, you know, individuals who may have firsthand accounts of how things, I do a lot of archival research, you know, so looking at um, historical documents that are kept in museums, that are kept in, you know, archives and that you find in libraries and so on and so forth. Um, and what I was able to do was uh, come across some archives that gave me the background on the connection between daily and the mafia. And when I saw that, and then I was also getting information about in the archives about Daly's relationship with the Hamburgs, then I could see a pattern. And because I have familiarity with black gangs, I was like, damn, this the same trajectory. This is the same scenario. Gang chief to what? Uh, political power, organizing, maturing, they became mayor. But for us, there was a barrier because they were able to use the police to stun our growth and development as, you know, a street. So basically every story of a black gang leader is the same story as daily. It's just that the, the, their growth and development of the black gang gets stunted by daily using his police to criminalize the black so gang. So I just like I could have I could have made that same connection between uh, uh, Callaway and Pepelo and the brothers that started the Vice Lords, or I could have used the same scenario uh, between Jeff Fort and Bull and Daly. It was just that this time because I had already done the the Stones book. I use David in that place to connect to David because they all the same person, just with different opportunities. You know, knowing that uh, a lot of a lot of these leaders mm -hmm. are direct connect, you know, black leaders from different organizations mm -hmm. have a direct connection to the South. Oh yeah, them coming from Mississippi, yeah, Dallas, yeah. Tennessee. Um, and then coming to Chicago and, and, and making their bones. Yes. Um, was that was that eye opener for you? Or what yeah. Did you get from yeah. Yeah. That's 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 a really good point too. That was eye opening for me. So what I what I discovered in my research when I started digging into the backgrounds of these uh, these individuals, I found out that most of them. So when you're looking at Jeff Fort, you're looking at Larry Hoover. You're looking at David Barksdale and even some of the brothers are, 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 are part of the, 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 the Vice Lord Nation, but specifically Larry Hoover, David Barksdale and Jeff Fort were all from very similar areas in Mississippi. Right. Uh, they were from what we call the Mississippi Delta area. 
And when you study the history of the Mississippi Delta, you'll find that the Mississippi Delta, its, its notoriety came uh, because it, rep it was the area, it was the place in the United States of America that had the most brutal form of slavery. The most hardcore forms of slavery existed in the Mississippi Delta. Why? Because in the Mississippi Delta was where uh, cotton uh, was a um, was the um, there was a, a system of, of, of and I don't, I don't want to get too 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 deep into it, uh, but basically cot cotton plantation and cotton planting requires what is known as um, a chain, they call it a gang system of slavery, right? Where you needed hundreds and hundreds of slaves in order to plant cotton and to work the cotton fields, right? So you needed to have a system in place in order to control large numbers of slaves who were out with tools and, and things that could be used as weapons. So you had to have a very brutal form of slavery. So what happened was it, it, it generated a culture in the area that um, promoted groups, work, individuals working together in groups. And I think what happened is because those individuals, and as you mentioned, it's really interesting that all of our major street gangs were led by guys who came from the Mississippi Delta because they were they were and not just they spent their formative years there. They learned how to use and employ leadership to get groups to work together, but also they understood how to manipulate violence because violence was being used against them to control them. So they understood these things and they were able to use those skills that they had, probably not even consciously. But when they came to Chicago, they, was, they were able to use those things that they learned as little boys and coming from that culture, those, that culture to organize, you know, street gangs. You know, I find it very interesting, like this, this juxtaposition, mm -hmm. right? Where you have, so you, you, have, you have the Irish, they come to Chicago, mm -hmm. they're coming from the British Isles. Yes. Where they're the lowest yes. on the totem pole. Yes. And they're fighting the English primarily. Yes. A thousand years. Yes. Thousands of years. Yes. They, I mean, not only fighting, but losing. Yes. They're losing that war. Yes. They've been losing this war for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And then you get, you know, African Americans that are brought to this country, probably by the English, right? Mm -hmm. In the Delta, mm -hmm. as you describe, like the Delta. The, the entire South is, you know, is, is racist and slavery exists, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. there's levels to it, right? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, if you're, in, if you're in North Carolina, you'd probably rather be there than to be in the Delta. Yes, right? this yes. Is the, the true dirty yes. South. This is the Delta. You're yes. a Delta slave. Right? Yeah, yeah. So you, you have these people that are coming, that were former slaves, or descendants of uh, yeah. formerly enslaved people. And sharecroppers. And sharecroppers. Yes. Hard living people that also probably, they're growing up with people from the British Isles. Yes, right? they are. They're, they're in, the people that settled the British Isles are, are Scots-Irish. Yes, they are. Right? The southern, yes. Those southerners are Scots-Irish. Right? Yes. So, at, you know, three, four hundred years ago, all of our destinies are intertwined. Yes. And somehow these Africans, these people from the Scottish, the, you know, the British Isles, the mm -hmm. Scots-Irish, mm -hmm. and it's, it's been intertwined for so long. Mm -hmm. It's intertwined in the South, right? Yes. And people moved to Chicago. Mm -hmm. the, the descendants of these formerly enslaved people, yes. these Irish immigrants, and it's, it is still intertwined. Yes, it is. It's still yes, it intertwined. Is. Yes, it is. We have this, like, shared destiny. Yes, it is. Yeah. Where we fight each other. Mm -hmm. where we fight these wars with each other. We're mm -hmm. constantly... In, 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 in engagement. Yes. I, I just find that just yeah, incredibly yeah. interesting. And that's that's what I'm trying like a lot of times like we we we've been having this discussion and we really haven't had a lot of conversation about the gangs and I think that's what people are saying about the book. Hey, I thought this book was about, you know, uh, uh, the disciples or the black disciples and it is. But the story of the black disciples is that story, you know, this uh, continuation of a fight between uh, two lowly groups of ethnic groups who've been fighting each other intergenerationally for hundreds of years from down south to up here and it you know it just continues 
Yeah, so it's, it's you know, and that's that was the King David Boss daily dynamic to, you know, to kind of learn that history. But through the lens of, you know, something that the average person in the community can identify with because the average person in the community can identify with, you know, the, a gang life, you know, because it, it is so uh, influential in our day to day lives and they and they can identify with the racism that comes from a racist, you know, mayor. Right. And so that's why I told it from that lens. But it's really just a continuation of that history that you just laid out. Yeah. What was the relationship between. The disciples under David Boxdale, the vice lords, and the disciples and the stones, and uh, what was it? Yeah, that's a that's a, that's a real uh, deep relationship too. So, uh, thinking about the stone, the stones were um, wood, a woodline organization. They were birthed out of out of woodline. Uh, the disciples essentially were birthed out of Inglewood. Um, you have to understand that Woodline and Inglewood are um, neighborhoods that are divided by one street. They're right next to each other. So when black people were pushed out of Bronzeville, when we were displaced from Bronzeville, half of us were pushed into Inglewood and the other half of us were pushed into, into Woodline. And um, the Woodline side, is the east side, the uh, street that separated the disciples from the uh, stones was the street wood line, right? Uh, and what happened was those brothers and sisters that lived east of wood line really had access to things that brothers and sisters that lived west of wood line didn't from west wood line all the way into Inglewood. There were institutions, um, that uh, boys and girls club, you had, uh, um, you had some major churches in the area, you had the Woodline organization. So what ended up happening was when money came to Chicago to work with these displaced residents that lived in Inglewood and Woodline, Woodline residents got first access. And when the money came for the street organizations, the Woodline, the, the Stones, the Blackstone Rangers at the time had first access and got resources to the degree that the disciples weren't getting these resources and they created a tension between the two groups. It's the same, you know, divide and conquer kind of manifestation, right? The same thing that happened in Africa with the Hutus and the Tutsis. And the Stones were the smaller population. The disciples were a larger population because they went all the way from West Woodland all the way back to, so you had the East Side Disciples all the way to the main disciples and that's David and them. Both organizations started on 65th Street. It's just that 65th Street and Stewart was the Inglewood Disciples, 65th Street and Blackstone were the Blackstone Rangers. So what happened was the Stones had a little more access to resources and they created this uh, exclusive, exclusivity as an organization. They, became, they were kind of exclusive and um, highfalutin, so to speak, in terms, even though they was all streets, they had more. And they kind of look down on the disciples like that's where the term dirty folks come from. You know, although we from the hood, we all from the hood. We looking at folks as y'all dirty. But the thing was, the folks were massive in numbers. Right. So they got the numbers. And so that created a lot of a back and forth between the groups and that caused you know a divide and conquer and friction they were the same group of guys it was just on one side of the street some had a little more as poor people than others that didn't have nothing one side had butter for their bread the other people just had bread yeah and, so and, if and you say dirty folks i mean for people that grew up on the, in Chicago, that is a huge insult. Yeah, I know it's a, I know, I know, I know, I know. But I'm, tr you know, I but I'm, 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 I use it not to be disrespectful, yeah. but to get us to understand the divide and conquer and how that was that phenomenon was created. It was created because uh, those who wanted to see us divided 
told this group, you special and you better. And because they carried themselves as if they were, like if you look at the culture of the Stones, the Stones, they, they exclusive. You know, uh, you know, they standing on, you know, what they consider the higher principles and qualities. You know, we drawn off of one, drawn off his higher self, Mo, you know. But, you know, folks like, okay, that's what y'all do, then we gonna be grimy, we gonna be low life in terms of our, and we gonna, you know, we gonna take pride in it. It's no different than if, you know, if you went to college. You know, and you got the fraternities, you got one, you got one fraternity, you got the alphas that they, you know, kind of Dr. Kingish and elitish and the Q dogs, they, you know, they Qs, they dogs, you know, it becomes a part of their culture and it creates a tension between it. So the streets is no different. So it's no disrespect to, you know, so you would say, to the, you would say, you say like the stones more like the alphas and. And folks are more like the Q dogs. Like yeah, 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 yeah. And no disrespect to the Stones, the Alphas, the Qs, or the yeah. folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, now, so you know, I, I know, uh, I know what you're saying, and we got, yeah. love, we got love for, you know, we got love for real people everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. But the reality is that right now, the the trajectory is that these men were not human. They was monsters. Mm -hmm. they, you know, uh, they killed. It was blood. They they responsible for millions of murders, millions of murders mm -hmm. and man throughout mm -hmm. you know the Chicago land area. And I think you trying to put that human side to to what it is and, and show that these men I know I know are, are not. Uh, their, the crimes that they may have committed mm -hmm. are not uh, worse than things uh, committed by people that we may help hold the high esteem, whether it be George Washington and uh, the father of JFK uh, or others that mm -hmm. may have done things that are worse than what you know these men may have done in their teenage years. Correct. Um, you know, right now we're still looking at. Jeff Ford being, Jeff Ford, Chief Malik being incarcerated forever. Mm -hmm. And when you're looking at uh, Larry Hoover being incarcerated forever. Yes. What, what's your, what, what's your, what's the, what do you believe this comes from? The same thing with Lord Gino mm -hmm. and many others. Right. Um, what do you think this comes from? Well, I know I know what it comes from. It comes from um, the threat of these men from David Barksdale to 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 Larry Hoover to Jeff Ford as the threat of their leadership and their ability to lead. And, and, and I don't want to use this term in a uh, debased way, but uh, as men of violence, right, not violence in a negative way, but violence in a way that. Uh, this society operates. You know, one one of my favorite books, um, uh, which is which is called um, the Power Elite, and in that book, they give a scenario of, of 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 men of power and men of consequence, and they say if you if you if you if you give a man uh, genius, or if you give a man a violence. If you give a man of violence, genius, and a historical opportunity, you will get a Napoleon. If you give a man of violence, uh, 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 a historical opportunity, and an ideal, you'll get a Gibraldi, who was, was an Italian, a great Italian leader who brought the Italians together. If you give a man of violence just a chance and nothing else, you get a fascist dictator like Mussolini. Or in the capitalistic world, you get a gangster. So the gangster, the Mussolini, the Gibraldi, the Napoleon, they all the same individual, just with different opportunities. So if you give that gangster a historical opportunity, right, and you give him genius, a strong education, he will become a great leader. And so this society is organized to identify those kind of men in our community 
who can be that great leader. And they criminalize them and make sure that they never rise to the position of power where they can lead the masses of people. And that's the reason that Larry has been, as you mentioned, incarcerated forever. And it wasn't because of the crime that he was committed, it was his potential to lead our people out of their condition. Same with Chief Malik and the same with David Barksdale if he would have survived past his 27th year. I think, you know, and I, I know we just, just, you know, reflecting on Chief Malik's situation because I think the world know more about Larry Hoover mm -hmm. and his situation mm -hmm. than they do actually Chief Malik Jeff for his situation. Yes. That his current situation. Because when I when I reflect on mm -hmm. um, his charge, not just the charge, but the, the the background of the charge, the actual case. Yes. Being an expert, what, what would you say, knowing what you know, what would you say is the is the what would you say to his actual case? that you feel to say, like, man, this this ain't right at all. Like, you mean well, this is correct or this is not right. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to word, uh, like, what would you say to uh, a mass group of people that don't know much about his particular case mm -hmm. that would say, man, this needs to be looked into further. Um, this is like a smoking gun or mm -hmm. this is something directly in front of us that this is not fair, this is an injustice. Yeah, well, so the difference, they're, 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 both of their situations are similar, you know, as far as I can see. But I hear what you're saying about uh, uh, Chief Malik. So his situation is um, a, a, a severe form of injustice because he is, has been incarcerated uh, because he was convicted of uh, being a part of domestic terrorism, being a part of a, you know, uh, uh, a, a criminal enterprise that had terroristic kind of uh, intents. Well, when you look at the case, all of what they claimed that he was a part of was done while he was in a federal penitentiary. He was locked up, right? So um, based on phone calls that he was having with members of his organization, the individuals who got accused of domestic terrorism were not connected to the individuals at all who got found with this so-called rocket launcher that was going to be used to do domestic terrorism. You had one group who was at an Islamic conference in Libya. And then you had another group who these individuals were, uh, these two groups of stones, right? Or El Rukans. One is at an Islamic conference. One group is still in the streets uh, trying to buy some drugs. And an uh, agent comes in and basically entraps them and tells them, hey, I got a cheap rocket launcher and I got some grenades and this kind of stuff that you could get on the cheap. And they kept saying over and over again, we don't want this. We're not interested. We just want to get these drugs. And they kept, you know, it was entrapment and ultimately just gave them the rocket launcher. Right. And what happened was it had a tracking device in it. And then what they did was they took that group that had that rocket launcher and they connected them to this group that had gone to this Islamic conference and said this is domestic terrorism. Had nothing to do with each other. And Chief Malik was in jail telling them on the phone, be careful who you talk to and don't be involved. He was actually advising them not to be involved with anybody that's gonna be trying to sell drugs or any kind of weapons or any of that because we are trying to move in a different direction. And so once the feds entrapped that one group, they connected all of them and threw away the key. So what I heard you say, because because the thing is for laymen mm -hmm. that don't know anything, they heard Chief Wiley, they heard Jeff Ford, which is the same person. Right. In layman's terms, you are saying oh, the El Rukins and the Black Stones who, who, who were the, the organization once was uh, Black Stone, Black Peace Stone Rain, mm -hmm. and then they separated. One part was El Rukin, one part considered themselves still to be Black Stones, mm -hmm. but people were still out of the streets, and we're talking about hundreds, possibly thousands mm -hmm. of members. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a group of 
uh, a group of the specific El Rukas, which was number-wise, what would you say went to Libya? Oh, it was a small group. A small group of about 10 to 15. Uh, 10 to 15 El Rukas. Mm -hmm. uh, go to Libya to an Islamic conference. Yes. Now, they're solo. This is not a... They're going to Libya for an Islamic conference. This is many people from around the world yes. going to come, come to this Islamic conference. They come back to America. They're still, out of these thousands, out of these thousands of members, some out of the group is still in the street. They connect with a guy trying to buy drugs. He's a, he's a DA agent. He's an agent, a federal agent. Mm -hmm. um, he say, man, take these rocket launchers as well. And they say repeatedly. Nah, we don't want it. We don't yes. want it. And record. We don't want it. We good. We good. We good. Eventually, man, take it for, you know, $50. You know, I'm basically going to give it to you. All right, man. All right. Get, get so it. we can get this done. We can get it done. You push, you keep pushing it. Take it off my hands. Come on, man. I need to get rid of it. Okay, man, $50. Hey, man. Don't give it. We can find something to do with it. It's a tracking device on it. It goes back to uh, the, the, uh, the fort at the time. It gives the feds a uh, right to, to come in, rally everybody up with a warrant, take everybody down. People been in federal custody 30 plus years. That's how it went. That's how it happened. Jeff Ford was never out. Chief Malik wasn't even out at the time. Can, can I say something too Go to ahead. just add to that? Talking to like a lot of um, like high ranking uh, El Rookie members, they was also feeding a lot of them dope to get them to tell. Like heroin. They was like having withdrawals being locked up. And it's a large section of them that ended up cooperating. They was getting heroin too, too. Mm -hmm. in, in the feds. Why they were in federal custody. I heard that from high ranking El Rookie members coming yeah. out of their mouth. Yeah, we, and we, we write about that in the book. Yeah. Yeah, there was prosecutorial misconduct because they were having sex with the with the lawyers and all kind of stuff in the MCC down there, and these guys were the ones that end up being used to testify against the other ones. So you know, when we talking about the possibility, but you know, God, God willing, man, these brothers come home, uh, and, and, and when you hear in layman's terms what actually happened. Mm -hmm. You can say, man, this is not, this is not fair. Not just. This is not just, and something needs to be done. As far as the Larry Hoover situation, because I know we're talking about the black disciples. Mm -hmm. How was his relationship with uh, David Boxdale, King David? Uh, La Larry had a. Uh, it's interesting. He had a relationship with with David Boxdale and the leadership of the Stones, Jeff Ford and Bull Harrison, but mainly Jeff Ford at the time. You have to understand, Larry is a little younger than them. And Larry was, was a part of a, a, a street group called the Supreme Gangsters. They were, they were young and they were really, um, they were kind of the fly dudes, of the, they, were, they were the next generation and they were very, they was just hot at the time, you know, in terms of fashion, in terms of just being street dudes, David and them being a little older. So everybody was trying to recruit Larry and his guys to be a part of their group, right? But because he's in close proximity of, of the black disciples, they had a little more influence because he's like right in their backyard. Um, and so, but basically the Stones try to recruit him. And David tries to recruit him. Uh, originally, not David, but some, some disciples under da David's leadership, they tried to force Larry and the Supreme Gangsters to become disciples. Like, intimidate them, you know, shoot at them and jump on them. And it was a lot of back and forth. But ultimately what happens is um, David then seeing that that don't work, that these little brothers are thorough, that they are... They ain't no punks. They can't be made to do nothing. David goes to them and he said, hey, look, you know, we we stronger together than we are separate. And and because uh, Larry's main interest was, you know, they're younger and he didn't know how much longer they can endure these these attacks. He felt politically it was in his interest for them to join up with the disciples, the black disciples, to keep things in his, you know, he was telling this guy, hey, look, we can't take too many more L's. We can't, we keep getting shot and this kind of stuff. Let's just, 
you know, and because David is given the olive branch of not just us coming up under them, but we will share leadership. I will be a king. He will be a king. We sh and that was that was an ingenious move because David didn't have to do that. But what he did was he offered to Larry, you be a king and I'll share my king leadership, which we be co-kings. And that's what convinced him to come in and join up with 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 the black disciples. And so they took that supreme gangster movement and brought it together with the black disciple movement. And then they became the black gangster disciples. Would you they all also there was a decision made that they the princes. Oh, yes. How, yeah. So how? What, what they what they did was uh, they they had a they had an agreement, which, again, this is this is masterful leadership thinking. What, what they did was to make sure that they maintain a trustful balance between the two groups. David suggested that I'll pick a prince. I'm the king, I'll pick a prince. And you a king, you pick a prince from your side and then we will exchange princes, right? To make sure that on your side is somebody to represent my interests and on my side is somebody to represent your interests. Which is a masterful, like... That's a medieval level. I mean, when you read about, like, uh, the Ottoman Sultan mm -hmm. and, like, the, the king of the Habsburg Empire and, yes. uh, you know, the king of France. This is, they exchanged, they would exchange, you know, children. Mm. And say, you raise my son and mm -hmm. I raise your son. Yes. So that we know if, there's, if we ever go to war, we're, we're going to have a truce. We're going to trust each other. Mm. We're going to have an insurance policy. Yes. And they will raise it and they could be completely different people, right? Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. the, the Turks, the Ottomans would do this all the time. Mm -hmm. Like the uh, uh, like the, the principalities of like Romania, Wallachia, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So they would they would they would say, Hey, we'll raise your son, you guys better not go to war with us. We'll we'll take your son. And, and really it just ensures that everyone understands each other's concerns. Yeah, yeah. Right? And also, like I said, it's an insurance policy. If, you, if mm -hmm. something happens, somebody can pull the cord if mm -hmm. somebody breaks the, the agreement. Mm -hmm. and that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's crazy level of yeah. insight. Yeah. Yeah. To, to see the age of these young men. In the 20s. You're talking about 27. Isn't it 20s? 27. David passed when he was 27. 27, right? And even uh, Larry being incarcerated at the age of what? 21. 21. Uh, Jeff being locked up at. I know he was in and out yeah, of prison, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, but you're talking about the decisions and the leadership of teenagers that still manifest to this day. Mm -hmm. you know, rules and regulations that they or standards that they set that still reg that still uh, stands through the test of time. Yeah, and they cre yeah, and they created these on their own. This was with no kind of influence or mentorship God from guys that, because remember the guy the generation of guys that were older than them that neck that generation prior of gangsters were killed off by the italians during the uh, policy king era mm -hmm. so those policy kings who were the their predecessors had you know uh had been killed off so they had to reinvent the wheel and for them to be from 1963, when they come into their formation as, as black disciples, to 1960, I mean, as, as devil's disciples. So they evolved from devil's disciples in 1963. By the time they get to 1969, they become the black gangster disciple nation. Right? That's six years. And even before they became the black gangster disciples, they went from 1963 to being devil's disciples and then shortly after that dropping devils because they didn't think that that devils was uh, uh, appropriate for the direction that they wanted to go in so then they just became disciples and then when the black power movement kicked in and the panthers and all then they took on the title black disciples what was what was the relationship between them and the Black Panthers? They were tight. The Black like one of the things I did learn in writing this book, I always was under the assumption that the Stones were closer. Now I know, I know it was a rift between the Panthers and the Stones, but their ideologies of 
you know, the stones being red, black and green or red and black and, you know, nationalists and the pyramid and the cultural thing, you would think that they would be closer with the Panthers. But actually, the BDs, the black disciples were closer with the Panthers than any other group. Mm. They were like they rolled on a day to day basis with Fred Hampton. Fred Hampton kicked it with them. They had free breakfast programs, you know, in a big house and their headquarters. All of that was. They were headquarters for the black disciples. Uh, they had a couple. They had one, 444 West 63rd Street. That's where those little, where, uh, uh, you know, the church that burned down right there on Stewart, right up in there was where one of their headquarters. Then they had the big house that was on like 60, I was 61st to 62nd in Halsted. So they had a couple of places, but uh, the place that they had their free breakfast program was on 60, 61st in Halsted. I, before we wrap up, I want to because we got some people in the in the in the comments that spoke about the relationship with David and the police. Oh, and, okay. Can you speak to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you know, I I was able to. So what was happening is when uh, when after Dr. King galvanized, came in and galvanized the Lower Stones and disciples in the movement, and then he kind of got chased out of Chicago by the mayor and that left them basically to defend themselves. The mayor created a gang intelligence unit to kind of, you know, attack them, right? So what was going on at the time was they were under constant surveillance, 24 hour surveillance where the police were fo following them around and they knew they were being followed. So a lot of times, you know, the police would roll up on David and them, but they did this to all street organizations and would be talking to them. And so there was, back then it was different. Those guys were not afraid to engage the police, right? They, you know, if the police stopped them to talk to them, they dealt with the police as their peers. It was a conversation that like was going to man to man. man, to man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 which, yeah, yeah. I ain't, I ain't, I, I ain't got the whole nun back from you. You ain't nobody that I gotta not talk to or whatever. So, yeah, it was different. They were they. I, I like the way you said on a man. They dealt with them on a man to man. And it was if it was conflict, like I, we write in a book one time about uh, a conflict that happened between the police. It was some corrupt police that was harassing brothers. David organized the disciples, and this is even before Larry and them joined up with them. And they all marched from the big house on 61st and marched to the head, the 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 seventh. Uh, uh, seven district police station, Inglewood police station, to the police station and called the commander out and said, we want to meet about this harassment. It ain't going to be tolerated. And the police buck. And they they whooped the police at the police station, beat their ass, drove them back in the police station, turned their cars over and went back to their neighborhood. So if you pulled them over, they wasn't getting ready to stop and not talk to you. They was going to tell you straight up how they thought about what you was doing. So this conversation about David talking to the police or telling, no, he was telling them what they could do and what they couldn't do. What and you're not gonna what you're not going to do. And if, if, if you persisted, it was going to be consequences. You know, I just remember back in the day when I was <clears throat> shorty, they used to talk about uh, instances where uh, Willie Lord would be somewhere and a group of vice lords would be there, and uh, the police would roll up, mm -hmm. and you know, some you know, a guy might open this, you know, a couple guys might open the trench coat, and they'd be like, and they just pull off like, yeah, this ain't this yeah. ain't not today, yeah, no, you know, this no. ain't what you want right now. No, no, it's 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 shootouts. You know, we write about it in a book. One time they was harassing a little disciple, <clears throat> and he came and told David, and David and them went and said, hey man, you know. This shorty, you know, we got him. He cool. And they, you know, they got into it with the police and it turned into a shootout. Right. And it wasn't no running and, 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 you know, it was what it was. Right. And they you went on back. Who, you know who we is. Yeah, yeah. Y'all yeah. shot at us, we shot at Yeah, that was, that was it. You know, they, people say uh, Chicago got the, the police, the uh, Chicago police force, the biggest gang in Chicago. Yeah. I mean, mm. people, many people say that. And I don't, you know, I, I don't believe every police wake up in the morning and go be a, uh, a, a crooked cop or a beat a butthole or guys, I, don't, I ain't against the police force in that sense. But what I'm saying is that the mutual respect at that time was there 
as well as it was understood that, you know, you do something wrong to me, I do, hey, I do something wrong to you. And it might not ever be a prison mm -hmm. connected to that. That's right. Because this ain't got nothing to do with uh, I committed, you committed a crime to me. All of a sudden, I'm committing a crime to you. Yeah. And we're handling it like that when we see each other. That's right. And That's I right. might not ever go to jail for this particular thing. That's right. You know, and, and it's a mutual respect in that aspect. That's mm -hmm. So I think yeah. people that don't understand the back history right. of what it is may get a misunderstanding when you say he talks to the police. The mafia talks to the police. Absolutely. You know, uh, everybody spoke to the police. It's just what level of communication are you doing? That's right. Am I trying to, I don't think any one of these guys, you can catch them on the stand towards somebody else, regardless if it was an enemy or not. That's just mm -hmm. was a, the position they was in. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. We'll take care of it on, on the street level, but uh, or, or writing the confession, the statement towards somebody. Right. Else. To that. It was it was it was a different time that the, the relationship between the street guys and the police was one of uh, equal status, right? That they were they considered themselves leaders and that they didn't see themselves subservient to the police. I know one time there was a, a story that we wrote about a, a, a true story where. Um, there was, t you know, the, the Stones leadership, Jeff and, and, and David were summoned to the Cook County Jail by Winston Moore. He was the warden of the jail in an attempt to kind of it was a bogus attempt to try to settle some differences between the two groups. So they went down there, you know, as contemporaries, as leaders, they went to meet the man asked us, he the warden, of jail, he asked us to come meet and sit down and talk. And we did. And what happened was he really tried to set them up for them to have conflict with each other and, you know, told them, look, y'all go in the bathroom and just fight it out. You know, they down there with their guys. And so he said, y'all going, you know, so it turned into a little scuffle. And David was a David was a uh, was a, a golden glove. But he was a he was a, a professional wow. level boxer. You know, Jeff at the time, this is before Jeff, you know, he wasn't no boxer dude. Jeff was a different kind of leader. So he banged Jeff up a little bit, right? So of course, as street guys, okay, it's gonna be it's gonna be a consequences for this. And so when they get back to the neighborhood, the police go to David, and remember, they neighborhoods are East Side Disciples and the and the and the, and they it's only one street that separates them. So they occupy in the same area. So the police come to David and say, hey, man, I heard you whoop Jeff ass, you know, trying to start something. And he laughed. He said, hey, man, yeah, they said they're going to pop me for that or whatever. Ha ha. He he. They say, well, yeah, he said, watch this. And so David gets in his car and the police follow him. But this, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, he told the police that they was going. So he drove on into they to they block and they shot at him. Lefty and some dude shot up his car. You know, and then the police got left in them for shooting up David's car. So then somebody might say, oh, he, he you know, he worked with the police. No, who, who, who is, what kind of person knowing somebody going to shoot at them, get in their car and drive in onto the block? But a person that's brave and is fearless, right? And that's what he did. And, you know, he probably didn't think that they was going to do, you know, shoot like that. But that's what ended up happening. And the police caught you know, lefty and them and they got locked up for it. But, you know, it was that was a different time. They didn't see the police as no, you know, no big threat or nothing. It was, you know, hey, you know, the police do the police. We do us. And if we got a problem with the police, we check the police, too. And if we got to go to jail for that, so be it. You know, Dr. Lance, man, it was an honor to have you here today, brother. Oh, it's always an honor to be here, my brother. Give us, give us, give us <laughs> the name and title of the book and where they can grab that book. Uh, the name and title of the book is King David and Boss Daly, The Black Disciples, Mayor Daly, and Chicago on the Edge. Uh, the book can be, you know, most people getting the book from uh, Amazon, you know, order from Amazon, or you could get it from order from Target. Either one. We're going to put the link in the bio for everybody uh, watching. Yeah. Um, and, uh, man, we appreciate you once again. Lastly, uh, film opportunities, 
Should they, you know, can they email you something like that? You might be doing yeah, that. yeah, or you. Yeah, they can, they can hit up the shop podcast yeah. and, and we'll make connection, man. This is uh, great information. And we couldn't have it. We couldn't do. We could not do this without you, man. We definitely appreciate. Thank it. you for inviting me, my brothers. Always. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.